He was the CEO of Longbridge Associates in London, Senior Managing Director of Beer Stores in New York and London, President of Endosuez Mexico, Mexico City, and Managing Director of Endosuez Capital Latin America, Paris. He was Vice President of Salomon Brothers in New York, Vice President of Citibank, New York, Libreville, and Manama, consultant at the Enterprise Program Washington, and board member of various companies in the U.S. and Mexico. Mr. Hayek has an MA in International Management from the University of Texas at Dallas, and BBA from the University of, of Houston. He is conversant in 11 languages. Yes. Please help me to welcome Dr. Hayek. Thank you, Hiam. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, as you heard, I'm an investment banker and by background, but I'm not going to talk to you about investment banking. I'm going to talk to you about something that's closer to my heart and I hope is close to your heart as well. Um, I understand you're coming from more than 15 countries, maybe some 20 countries, so uh, I'm delighted. I mean, I cannot tell you how happy I am to see such diversity, to see the Lebanese diaspora, in this case the Maronite diaspora, truly well represented. It makes me so proud to see you here. Thank you for being here. I'm going to talk to you about ancient history. You've heard a lot about Lebanon. You've heard about, I mean, you've visited some places in Lebanon. You've heard about Lebanese politics. You know about Lebanon's culture. You know about its food. You know a lot about Lebanon. But what about ancient times? You've heard a lot about Phoenicians. Maybe you've heard that some people say we are Phoenicians. Some people say we are Arabs. You know. The whole point is really not important. At the end of the day, what's important is where we are today and how we look to the future. But looking to the future, we should be proud of our past. And part of our past is what this country has given to the world. I tell you, in my own opinion, the most important gift that we have given to the world is the alphabet. The alphabet is the means of communication across distance and across time. Before the alphabet, you could only communicate from person to person. Before the alphabet, even with the writing systems, like hieroglyphic and cuneiform, you could only communicate from one person that knew the code to another person that knew the code. If you knew the hieroglyphic code, you could understand what somebody has etched on a pyramid or something like that. But if you were like 99.999999% of the population, you could not read hieroglyphic and you had no idea and therefore there was no communication and therefore there was no education and therefore there was no transmission of knowledge. Without transmission of knowledge across distance and across time and across generations, there is no civilization. There's just mere existence. It's just like we put some stones on top of each other and we go hunt something and come eat it or plant something and eat it, but there's no civilization. And so this is why I am passionate about building a museum of the alphabet and about showing the world how all the alphabets of the world derive from the Phoenician alphabet. More on the alphabet later on. Okay. So I'm going to speak louder for the video, excuse me if I bother you. Um, this is the Middle East. This is where we happen to live. We live in this part of the world. Here is Egypt, one of the cradles of civilization. And here is Mesopotamia, another cradle of civilization. Um, these two areas, including the, what's called the uh, Fertile Crescent, which where Lebanon is, or the Levant. This is the most 
the oldest civilizations in the world come from here. It is also the oldest or the longest um, inhabited uh, area in the world. There are three cities in this area that claim to be the oldest cities in the world. One is Jericho in Palestine. The other one is Damascus in Syria. And of course, we think that Byblos in Lebanon is the oldest city. There is nowhere else in the world where archaeologists have been able to find Neolithic remains in cities that continue to exist today. So we're very, very old. Now, the people that inhabited this region on this side were Semites. Semites are people that include a number of cultures, if you like. So you have the East Semitic, which are people like the Akkadians and the Babylonians. You have what's called Central Semitic, which includes the North Semitic, that's Phoenician and Aramaic, and Middle Semitic, which is Arabic. And then you have South Semitic, which is Ethiopic, Amharic, and South Arabian. So there are Semites to the east, Semites to the north, west, and south. The civilization that lived here in Iraq was the oldest one was the Sumerians. The Sumerians. And the, um, the Sumerians eventually were supplanted by the Akkadians, and the Akkadians started writing in hieroglyphic. Thanks. I'm sorry, I don't have something to show you what hieroglyphic, I'm sorry, in, in cuneiform. I'm sorry, I don't have something to show you what cuneiform looks like. I should have put a slide for that, but I'll show you later on. And on this side was hieroglyphic. So in the middle, there were the people of Byblos that were thinking, you know, they were aware of both cultures. And so they developed from the cuneiform and the hieroglyphic something called the syllabic, the Byblos syllabic. It looks like an alphabet, but it was still in syllables. So it was not A, B, C, D, it was um, there was no A. It was ba, bo, bu, bi, and it was ka, ko, ku, ki, etc. So there were many, many signs, and it makes it very difficult for somebody to remember all the signs. Um, why does this happen? It's because this part of the world, our part of the world, was at the crossroad of these civilizations. And so they were getting ideas from both sides. This impacted not only the alphabet, it impacted other things that the people in this area were doing. This is Phoenicia. Now, the Phoenicians never called themselves Phoenicians. They called themselves Canaanites. And in the Bible, you hear a lot about the Jews and the Canaanites. The Phoenicians called themselves Canaanites, but the Greeks called them Phoenician. Why? Because in Greek, Phoenician means the red people. And why were these people red? We don't know exactly, but perhaps for two one of two reasons. Either because they were mariners, so they were very tanned when they got to Greece, or because they were selling purple. Purple was the first dye of cloth. It was red. It was very dark red, the color of blood. And so because these merchants were selling purple, they became known as Phoenicians to the Greeks. The Canaanites called themselves Canaanites because Canaan means the people of the lowland. Canaan are the people of the, the shore, the seashore. The people of inside are called Arameans. And I will later explain how we Lebanese are derived from, from people from Arabia, from Aram, from Aram, which are Arameans, and from Canaan, which are the Canaanites. 
the, these people started sailing out in around 3000 BC. And they went to the island of Crete in Greece. And in Crete, they founded what's called the Minoan civilization. Minoan civilization is the precursor to the Mycenaean civilization. Mycenaean means Greek. The Greek civilization is really based on the Phoenician Canaanite civilization. In the Bible, the Canaanites are called, you know, horrible people. The Jews are the great people, the chosen people of God, and the Canaanites are the, the bad people. Because the Canaanites used to live in the cities. They lived in Byblos. They lived in, in, in uh, Sidon, in, in uh, Tyre, which uh, here is Tyre, in Ugarit, in Arwad. And the Hebrews, Abrani, Abar, means to cross. So the Hebrews are the people that crossed the Jordan River, which was further down here. They crossed the Jordan River into Israel, into what that was called then Canaan. Canaan is the whole area. This entire area is Canaan. And so when you have a, a rural civilization that crosses into an urban civilization, what happens? Rural people always feel that urban people are bad. They have parties late at night. You know, they drink. They, their women are not, you know, as conservative. So they hate these people. They think of them as, as bad people. But at the same time, they really want to be like them. You know, everybody wants to be hip and everybody wants to be cool. And nobody wants to be traditional. So this is what happened to the Hebrews. They came into Canaan. There are all these Canaanites that live in cities, that have parties, etc. And they started saying, oh, these are horrible people. And you've heard of Jezebel, you know, King Solomon. You've heard of Bathsheba, you know, that, that David liked, uh, etc. But at the same time, what did they take from the Canaanites? They took their culture because they wanted to be like them. So they started dressing like them. They took their language. What we call Hebrew today is actually Canaanite, Phoenician. Um, modern Hebrew is a simplified form of old Hebrew, but Hebrew itself is Canaanite, is Phoenician. Um, they took their religion. So the god El, which was the supreme god of Biblos, became the god of the Hebrews. Now they said Elohim. Eloh means God. Elohim is the plural because always in Semitic languages when you want to say that something is important or you speak to some person and you want to say that they are important, you speak to them in the plural. You do the same thing in French, vous. Uh, in Spanish you say usted or vos, um, which is like a plural form. So um, El was the god of Biblos, and El stayed. So if your name is Gabriel, Gabr means strength, Gabri means my strength, El is the god. Gabriel is, I am, uh, God is my strength. If your name is Daniel, then your name Dan is judge. E, me, me. My judge, El, God is my judge, etc., etc. Every name that ends with El, you're going to have. If any of your names is like that, I'd be happy to translate it to you. Um, so, so this is a contribution that the Canaanites or the Phoenicians gave to the world. It's the monotheistic religion. Of course, we cannot claim that we invented monotheism because monotheism was invented in Egypt um, it was under the um, uh, emperor, uh, I'm sorry, under uh, the pharaoh, um, under the pharaoh Akhenaten. Akhenaten um, believed that the sun, Ra, was the, um, the god, the Aton, 
uh, was the god. And, uh, but Akhenaten had his son, Tutankhamun, who's very famous, Tutankhamun. You all know, you've seen the mask of Tutankhamun, or King Tut, as it's called in, you know, in modern lingo. But uh, after King Tut, so there was only these two pharaohs, and then the old guard took over again and, revolu and destroyed everything that Akhenaten had, had constructed, and they went back to the old religion. In this period, there were some Semites living in Egypt called the Hyksos. And the Hyksos took the idea of the one god and applied it to their own god, which was El. And this is how monotheism was created. So we indirectly contributed to the idea of the one god. Um, now, I want to go further than that. You know the Phoenicians were people, were mariners. Everybody says they were the man, mariners par excellence. And yes, they, they did go all over. They traded many things and they established many colonies. So they started here and eventually they colonized all the areas that you see here, including Carthage. Carthage became very important. Carthage is, is in Phoenician is Karthadasha. Karthadasha is um, means the new city. Qart is city, Hadasha is new. So, new city, this was their New York. You know, this is England, if this is England, this is New York. So, and this is, became so powerful, it fought against Rome. You have heard perhaps in history of the Punic Wars. Punic, Punic comes from um, Punic, which is PH of, Phoen of Phoenician, Phoenic, and in, 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 um, in Greek it was Phoenic, and so the PH, take out the H, it's become Panic or Punic. This is how the name came about. So the Punic, Punic Wars, um, three of them fought by Carthage and Rome. Um, in one of them, Hannibal, which is a name that you probably have heard many times before. Hannibal was, um, Hani is the, the beloved or, or the, the, the one that has the tender care of Baal. Baal was their god. So Hannibal was a general that took elephants across the Alps. Hannibal started out in Carthage. He took his armies, he crossed Spain, he crossed the Alps, and went into Italy and laid siege to Rome. This was the one time in its history that Rome was besieged directly until the Goths got to it about a thousand years later. And so um, that was an achievement, but eventually, unfortunately, Carthage lost the war. And when Carthage lost the war, the whole Mediterranean became open to Rome and Rome became the world's empire. So, yeah, we lost the war, but we fought Rome. You know, we were the enemy. <laughs> um, these, these Phoenicians, what did they take with them? They took, anybody knows, what did they trade? Yeah, sorry? I can't hear you. Cedarwood, yes, exactly. They traded cedarwood. What else? Sorry? Fish? Mm, no, everybody had fish around the sea. They, they traded olive oil. Olive oil was very important because olive oil and wheat are at the origin of civilization. How, are, how is olive oil and wheat at the origin of civilization? You remember I said civilization was born in this part of the world. What made civilization possible, what made it possible for people to stop hunting and going around and gathering, what made it possible for them to live somewhere and stay stable was agriculture. But agriculture, if you only had fruits and berries, you could not survive on that. You needed a staple food. Latin America has corn as its staple food. 
Asia has rice as its staple food. But the first staple food of civilization was wheat. And this country, believe it or not, is the origin of wheat. There are more than 300 varieties of wheat in Lebanon. The uh, bank, the seed bank in Norway has 300 varieties of Lebanese wheat. And it, what, why, why does that matter? It's because where you have the highest variety of a crop or of any DNA is where you have the origin of it. So the highest variety of human DNA is in East Africa and South Africa, and that's how we know that people originally, humanity originated in Africa. And that's how we know that wheat originated here. And olive oil was very important. Olive oil and wheat, wheat meaning bread eventually, give you high caloric content, very high. You can, you know, this is why manushe is so famous. You can have manushe in the morning, you have bread with some olive oil on it, you can go all day. And don't eat too much of that because, you know, you become like me. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's very caloric. They traded something else. They traded glass. Because the Phoenicians invented glass. They invented, you know, glass, not in its transparent form that we know today, but in its colored, opaque form. How did they come up with glass? How do you make glass? You take sand and you heat it up. And they had a lot of sand by the beach. So that's why the Phoenicians became the main traders of glass in the Mediterranean. Uh, they traded purple dye, like I said. There were two other things, three other things that they traded that were very important. Wine. Because wine, which originated somewhere in, in Iran, um, it originated in Iran, but eventually it got to the Mediterranean, and there were grapes that were grown in the Bekaa Valley and other places, and people were making wine. And so they were trading wine in large, um, in large uh, clay jars. They were trading also tin. Where were, where were they getting the tin? Well, one of the things that the Phoenicians did is they got to England, to Wales actually. And in Wales, they were mining tin. Tin was very important because they already had, in Cyprus, they had copper. Cyprus, Kupros, Kupros, copper. So they were, the Phoenicians were the first miners of copper. So they already had the copper, but why did they need the tin? They invented bronze. They made bronze, because you mix copper and tin and you make bronze. And um, they traded something else. Not fish, but salt. Now you say salt, but everybody has salt. The sea is full of salt. Yes, the sea is full of salt. But if you live inland, if you live here, if you live here or here, you have no salt. And if you, guess what? If you have no salt, you die. So that's why animals sometimes lick salt stones. People, of course, that lived far from the sea still get some salt from various types of foods and various types of rocks. But to get salt in a very nice format, where you could like sprinkle it on your food and etc., and get a lot of it, you needed it from the sea. And, but if you made a salt basin and dried the sea water and you got the salt and you were going to trade it, there was a problem. Somebody would get to it and would take it at night. So you can't sit there 24 hours watching your salt, watching the sea water dry. It's like watching the grass grow. So they had to make their salt basins in far areas that only their ships could reach. So that way, nobody was stealing the salt. And they were trading salt. And that's why the word in Semitic languages, including Arabic, for sailor is malah. Malah means salt maker. 
So a sailor is a salt maker. And that's where the name of the city in Spain, Malaja, Malaga, comes from. Malaga is the city of sailors or the city of salt, salt makers. Um, Cadiz in Spain comes from Qadis. Qadis means holy. It was the holy city over there. And um, so many cities were like that. I will not go through all the names of the cities. I want to talk to you about um, the spread of Phoenicians and their work in the Mediterranean meant two things. First, it was the first historic maritime empire. There was no real maritime empire of this importance because this was the entire known world. There was no maritime empire of this importance until the British Empire that colonized far away parts of the world. Now we, the Phoenicians, never built a land empire like the Assyrians and Babylonians and Egyptians and, and Persians and Greeks, etc. But they built a maritime empire. The other thing is, and this is beautiful, let me tell you why this is beautiful. Because the Phoenicians had all these lands without fighting wars. They were, they were carriers of civilization. They were traders. Sometimes you say, traders, merchants, they're just going after money. No, it's not that. That's not the importance. Yes, I trade. But when I trade, I give something of value to somebody. And I take something of value from them. And what I'm giving them is of more value to them than what they have. So this trade is what builds civilization. It, what, it is what builds human interaction. It is what builds, in economies, it is what builds efficiency. Because in economy, you have something called the competitive advantage. Why should I make um, wine if my neighbor can make it much cheaper? I'll give him something much less than what it would have cost me to make the wine, to buy the wine from him. The competitive advantage is central to economic theory. And this is what the Phoenicians were doing. Some people say that the Phoenicians invented banking and checks. I cannot verify that. But they say that because they would say, you know, I will sell you this on credit, you'll give it to me some other time, and somebody would write an IOU. And it is very likely, because in trade, I would imagine that you would be involved in, in credit and in checks and in IOUs. Um, I told you about the alphabet. I would like to show you some things. Maybe we have some time. Um, this is Aleph. Bet. Gimel, Dalet, He, Wow, Zain. A, B, G, D, He, U, Z, etc. Now, what are these names? Aleph became, became Alpha, Bet, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Eta, etc. So this is like, you know them under their Greek names, perhaps, from mathematics. Um, Aleph um, means domesticated animal. Okay. Any, any, like cattle basically, cow, bull, um, sheep, it was, it was an Aleph. And you can see um, the shape of it. Well, let me. على الشاشة وطفي الضوء فيكم تطفوا الضوء ايه عمل معروف 
لا مش الشاشة الضوء الضوء هيدا الضوء Okay, so you see here, this is the Aleph. In this case, there are many ways of writing the Aleph. Sometimes they would write it like this. Can you see this? Is this writing? Okay. Sometimes they would write it like this. But let's take this, which is the other side of that. It's easier for me to see anyway. Um, this, is, this is the head of a bull. Can you see this? Or if I put a dot here. This is, this is the head of an animal. Aleph. Bet. Who knows what bet means? Bet. Who knows what bet means? House. This is one form of writing it. Another form of writing it is like this. Bet, it became Greek beta. And then it became B. To the east, this Aleph became Alpha. Or written more simply, it became like this. Alpha, to write this one. In the, I mean, this is in the West. In the East, the Arameans took this and wrote it like this. Initially, they wrote it like this, and then they made it more stylistic. They wrote it like this. This is Aleph in Hebrew, but Hebrew today uses the Aramaic alphabet. And eventually, the Arabs, the Arabs wrote it like this. Now some of you think that this is the Aleph. No, this is not Aleph. This is called Kirsil Aleph, the chair of the Aleph. This is the Aleph, what we call Hamza today. And if you notice this, it looks like an A. You see the A? I don't know if you can see it from far away. But basically it is this Phoenician alphabet that led to the A in Arabic and led to the A or Alpha in Latin. The same thing with Bet. Um, the, this is the Greek formation and in, uh, in Aramaic this was written like this and eventually it was written like this. So this is the Bet in Hebrew today which is the Aramaic Bet. And in Arabic, it was written like this initially, and then it became like that, and then they put a dot under it to differentiate it from other letters. Actually, like this, it reminds you of this, that. You can do the same thing for all the letters. Dalit, Dalit means uh, Gimel. Gimel means Jamal, meaning camel. Dalit is a door. Fik nazil sheshib tamar. Dalit is a door. He, he, mean bi'a shuyan he. What does he mean? She, she. You can see the hair of a woman. <laughs> wow is, uh, we don't use it anymore. It's, it's just this thing that you shoot with. Yeah. Uh, Zayn means weapon. Zayn, uh, today we use it in Arabic as decorating, but it's because weapons became decorative. So it's a weapon. It's, um, het, who knows what het means? Wall, exactly. This is, this is not ki this kind of wall. It is the kind of wall that you see around your garden. It is a fence. Okay. Tet is a shield. Yod. Yad. Who knows what yad means? 
in Arabic. In Lebanese, we say Eid, because we use the Aramaic. I will get to that. Eid is the hand. So this is the shoulder. This is the arm. This is the arm. Calf. Yeah, calf. Exactly, that and calf. So this is your hand, calf. Lamed is a hook. Mim. Mim is the plural of my, mayim. Um, you know what my means, I hope. Water. So you can see the water. This is nun, is um, a uh, fish or food. Samek. Knows what samek is. Fish. Exactly. You can see the fish. Ayn. I. Brown. Pe. Pe in Phoenician, fe in Arabic means mouth. So it's, I know, it's like this. Um, tsad. Tsad is to fish, is to, is to hunt. And you can see the arm here, and this is a spear. So you're hunting with the spear. Tsad. Tof. Tof. In Arabic we say tafa, which is the back. So you see the head and the neck from the back. Resh means head in profile. Sheen. In Lebanese today we... Sorry. Okay. We're not here. In Lebanese today we say sin or sin. Sheen. Sheen. These are the teeth. And tau is just a mark. How did, the, how did the alphabet get diffused? Well, in Greek mythology, Herodotus tells us that Zdeus, Zdeus was the top god of the Greeks. Zdeus was, um, fell in love with Europa. Europa was a Phoenician princess from Tyre, from Sur. And um, he came at night he transformed himself into a bull, and he kidnapped Europe. And today, you can see it, this is a euro coin. And in euro, on a euro coin, this one from Greece, you see the bull, which is Deus, and Europa. This is the symbol of Europe today. Um, so Europe is a Phoenician princess, and Deus took her to Greece. And this guy... Cadmus, Cadmus here on the, on the door of the Library of Congress in Washington and here on a statue in Mexico City. Who was Cadmus? He was Europa's brother and he went to Greece to look for her. Where did Cadmus go? To Europe, to Europa. This is how the continent got its name. The continent got its name because of this Phoenician princess. And what does Europe mean? It's a Phoenician name. Phoenician name of Araba. Araba means the West. Cadmus, Kadmo, means the East. So we don't know if these people existed or not, but this might be just Herodotus mythology. But Kadmo, the East, went to Araba, the West, to look for her. By the way, the same word applies to Arabs as Europe because the Akkadians, who were also Semites, the Akkadians called the people that lived west of them Arab, Westerns. So Arab and Europe is the same word. Um, I think I'll be running out of time, but the, I want to tell you that the Phoenicians went uh, around Africa and uh, Hanno, I mean, Hanno visited Cameroon, Mount Cameroon, and another Hanno, um, under Pharaoh Neko of Egypt, in about the year 600 BC, circumnavigated Africa, went from, from, from the Red Sea around and all the way around. And how, we do, how do we know this? Because in the logbook of Neko, he says, we got to a point where the sun where uh, we got to a point where the sun was now to our, to our right. How, what does that mean? You see, when you're in Lebanon, you're looking west. You see the sun going like this, setting in the Mediterranean. And 
the sun will always be, even if it's in front of you or behind you, is always going to be to your left. Why will the sun be to your left in, in Lebanon? Because you're in the northern hemisphere. The sun is above the equator, and it will be to your left if you're looking west. But if you cross the equator, all of a sudden the sun is going to be rising and setting on your right-hand side. So this is how we know, because he said, it is amazing. Now, when he crossed the equator here, this is the equator, when he crossed here, he said, now the sun became to our, on the on our right-hand side. Um, let me say just two more things. I, I'm sorry I spent so much time on Phoenicians. It's because I'm excited about Phoenicians. But <laughs> I wanted to get to Maronites. And I'm not going to get to Maronites because I'm not going to get some time. But I want to tell you that Maronites are the Canaanites of the, of the coast, the Arameans of Syria. And the mixture of the two produced uh, Lebanese today. I want to tell you this is the prayer of our Lord in, in Aramaic Syriac. Um, does anybody, has anybody seen it? Has anybody have any interest in it? Etc. You've seen it before, Danielle. Okay, great. Um, has, have you heard it before? Should I say it to you? I'll say it to you. These are the words of Jesus because that's how he taught us to pray. uh, you have many things to be proud of. I told you about the Phoenicians, didn't get to tell you about the Christian um, history, maybe some other time, uh, but I'll take questions. Any questions? Hello, um, my name is Jana. I'm from Australia. I just wanted to ask, what's the most interesting fact that you can tell us about the Phoenicians? Just the, the one really interesting fact. The one I'm most interested in? Yeah, yeah, anything. Just the most interesting fact that you can tell us. Uh, the most interesting fact that I can say is that really what I said is you know, Phoenicians invented the alphabet. It's the greatest contribution to civilization. And it is about time that we as Lebanese today and with you guys in the diaspora, you see the Phoenicians were all over the place. The Phoenicians were not, they lived in Lebanon, but as you see, they were, they lived all over the world at that time. Um, they lived in Egypt. Um, they, how were the pyramids built? The pyramids, the Egyptians didn't have the technology to build the pyramids. It was not aliens that built it. It was people from Malta. Malta had people that already built major um, stone structures long before the pyramids. And it is um, one of the pharaohs, pharaoh, um, the father of pharaoh um, Khofu, that uh, asked the Phoenicians to bring architects to help him build a major monument and they brought somebody, f you know, architects and, and engineers from Malta to do that. Um, so the Phoenicians were all over the world. They were, they were the link between civilizations. And with you guys, um, you personi personify this. So the alphabet is a way to communicate across distance and across time. And with your presence and the presence of the Lebanese diaspora, I think we are a link for civilizations to communicate across distance. Hi there, um, Richard Shamali from South Africa. I'd like to ask why if the Phoenicians were everywhere around the Mediterranean, why is it really only the Lebanese who claim credit for the Phoenicians and why are other 
uh, civilizations, not saying no, the Phoenicians were us. Yeah, because they originated from here. I mean, this was the origin of the Phoenicians. Um, and everywhere else, they say they came from here. So the Carthaginians will say we are Carthaginian and we come originally from Tyre or in Lebanon. And of course, their language, the Carthaginian language, is Phoenician. So in Malta today, uh, Maltese is still probably the closest uh, language to Phoenician. So the Maltese today will still tell you we come, we're originally Phoenician. In Lebanese, we use a lot of Phoenician words. Um, uh, height was one of them that just uh, came up. Um, we use uh, many Phoenician words. Ain, um, of course, uh, as I, etc. We think it's Arabic, but it is really Phoenician. Um, and a lot, what is not Phoenician is, Arama is Arama Aramaic. Um, so we say Eid, which is Aramaic, but we understand Yad, which is Phoenician. Um, we say, uh, I can't, I have to think, uh, but uh, another Phoenician word, for example, is shik. Shik is to plant or to, to you know, put something in there. Um, our language is based on Aramaic and Phoenician structure, which is a northern Semitic linguistic grammatical structure, but with a lot of Arabic, meaning central Semitic vocabulary. But um, so it is, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, everybody says they have some Phoenician Sardinians, uh, Sicilians. If you go to Spain, they will say the same thing, but they all know it, Phoenicians came from here. Hi. Just like Madame Hiam said, uh, you know 11 languages, how to discuss in 11 languages. Out of curiosity, what are, th what are they and which one was the hardest to learn? <laughs> um, okay, I speak Arabic, French, uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese, um, Persian, Russian, Italian, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And, <laughs> and the hardest one to learn, um, I think the hardest language is Arabic, although it wasn't hard for me to learn, but it is the hardest among these. Of the ones that I learned, the hardest was Russian because it has uh, many different cases. I mean, German has three cases, accusative, dative, and genitive. But uh, Russian has, in addition to that, two other cases, so it becomes very difficult. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a picture now with Mr. Hayek, then we stop for a coffee break. And we come back here for the conference of uh, Mr. Wakim. <laughs>